evening and good morning or good afternoon to all present. Welcome to today's edition of ICS Wednesday Seminar. We have under discussion today the very pertinent issue of China's nuclear modernization and implications for India. Joining us today are two eminent speakers. Our first speaker for the day will be Dr. Hans M. Christensen. Dr. Christensen is director of the Nuclear Information Project at the Federation of American Scientists, where he provides the public with analysis and background information about the status of nuclear forces and the role of nuclear weapons. He is also co-author of the Nuclear Notebook column in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists and the World Nuclear Forces Overview in the SIPRI yearbook. Our second speaker today will be Mr. Jayant Prasad. He was the Director General of the Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis. He was earlier India's ambassador to Afghanistan, Algeria, Nepal, and the UN Conference on Disarmament in Geneva. He has also served as lecturer in the, his, uh, in the History Department of St. Stephen's College, University of Delhi. Chairing the session today is Air Marshal M. Mateshwaran. He is an Indian Air Force veteran with 39 years of active service. Currently, he is the founder president of the Peninsula Foundation, a policy research think tank based in Chennai. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all our panelists. Kindly note the housekeeping rules. All participants are requested to stay on mute during the presentation. Questions can be posted in the chat box anytime during the talk or by using the raised hand option during the Q&A session. Kindly unmute only when called upon by the chair. Our audience on YouTube can post their question in the comment section. Over to the chair. Thank you, Shruti, and uh, good evening and good morning to all the uh, audience who are uh, on this program. It's a very important uh, topic, particularly from India's perspective. And it gives me great pleasure to chair the session with two distinguished panelists, Dr. Hans Christensen and uh, Ambassador Jain Prasad. Particularly uh, pleasing is that a lot of uh, known faces also in the audience and uh, we look forward to a very intense and a lively participation in the discussions after the two panelists uh, give their initial presentations. Uh, well, uh, the uh, Chinese uh, modernization and when we are looking at the nuclear weapons, I think it's, it's, it's a parallel as well as a follow-up to the large-scale modernization of the military that's been going on, I would say, ever since the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, by uh, various estimates, the Chinese Navy, in terms of numbers of ships and even in terms of quality, will be the largest Navy by 2030. They are probably racing towards having a 500-ship uh, Navy. They are accelerating their aircraft uh, carrier uh, production, the submarine production. And, and uh, in terms of Air Force, uh, I've been monitoring that very closely. The quantum change in the technological capabilities and in the overall capabilities have been very interesting starting from the late 80s or early 90s to now. And the Chinese are now uh, at least have two fifth generation fighter aircraft program one that's already in service, another one about to enter service, and the third one is on the drawing board, so it's not on the testing stage. So how have they you know, plugged so much of gas that existed earlier and, and in this intervening three-decade period is an interesting question. The same context, the restructuring of their overall military structure is an interesting uh, uh, you know, development as well with five theta commands, and most interesting, Additions or uh, restructuring has been the context of air, uh, rocket forces and the strategic support force. Space capabilities have been enormous. They have more than 120 satellites dedicated to military applications and, and the ISR requirements. So the Chinese have moved quite clearly with a very clear perspective on strategic goals, which they have articulated by 2049, their military should be second to none, implying that they would be equal to the US, which is the foremost military power today, or if not, overtake them. And that requires uh, not only in terms of technological parity, but also they are looking at numbers. For years, the Chinese have very clearly articulated, starting from Washington's articulation, that the nuclear weapons are paper tigers and meant to be small numbers and only for deterrence. They seem to be moving away from that 
process as we are seeing now, because in the context of rising to a global power parity with the US, they also need to have reach and global presence and ability to deter their adversaries. And that seems to be driving the nuclear force modernization. Therefore, we are seeing increase in numbers, which Dr. Hans will you know, explain the developments that are coming in. But most importantly, while the US since 1945 have actually engaged and their strategy, military strategy based on a large number of alliances and large number of forward bases, they have over 600 basing capabilities. The Chinese have a very long way to go. They pretty much have uh, uh, no bases in the context of how the US operates. But particularly in the context of, you know, uh, being innovative and developing their capabilities, BRI is one of the mechanisms through which they combine economics and uh, dual use military application capability in developing probably the basis across Eurasia. And that gives an indication as one of the major reports from the US has indicated that if the BRI succeeds beyond the uh, you know, uh, anybody's expectations, the whole economic structure will change and it will plug into the Chinese-centric, you know, economic system. Uh, and these are all uh, uh, contributive factors, you know, that we must consider when looking at the nuclear strategy and nuclear modernization. Uh, the, without taking any more time, let me also point out one more, which we discussed with Dr. Hans, uh, is about Putin's use of, you know, nuclear threats in the current conflict. And his unambiguous warning has it contributed to deterring any thought process in terms of NATO or external powers physically intervening in support of Ukraine? Or has it, uh, you know, as Dr. Hans pointed out, the, the response has been more matured in terms of not allowing escalation to take place. So these are all, uh, you know, the important ones that we're looking at. So in the first case, I think Dr. Hans will cover much of the nuclear modernization process. And what does this mean for India, particularly, given the context of, you know, the collusion that uh, exists between Pakistan and China? Well, knowing the fact, and the Americans know it equally well as well, that China's, I mean, Pakistan nuclear capability has been masterminded and given by China completely. And what does that put in for India's strategic doctrine, strategic policy, as well as nuclear strategy in the longer term, which Ambassador Jain Prasad would certainly comment on that as well. So let me invite Dr. Hans to, you know, take the floor and give us a presentation. Dr. Hans. Thanks very much. Um, and thanks for your kind invitation to speak here. Um, it's a great opportunity and an, an honor. I have uh, never been to India, so this is my first virtual time, if you will. Um, it'll have to do for now. But, uh, but uh, yes, I have been asked to talk uh, over the next 20 minutes uh, about <clears throat> uh, China's nuclear modernization program. Uh, where is it heading? Uh, what does it look like? So um, I was going, I was asked to use some illustrations from the work we've been doing in monitoring uh, their developments. And hopefully that'll uh, spur some, uh, some interests. Uh, I guess I'm supposed to share my screen here for this one. Uh, can everybody see it? Yes. Let me uh, make this a little smaller here. There we go. Um, okay, so as it was mentioned at, at the beginning, you know, we are a nuclear information project, meaning that we provide a, a information, factual information and analysis about the status of nuclear weapons around the world, including, uh, of course, uh, what China is doing. And it's needless to say in, in dramatic development right now. Um, briefly about my, my presentation here today, and I'll be happy to make these slides available to you if you request later on. Um, there's probably more information here than I have room for in 20 minutes. So I'll, you know, go a little quick over some of the slides, but it's provided here so that you can have some background information. I'll talk a little about the, the, the evolving Chinese posture in general, go over the main elements of with the modernization programs we see, and then talk, uh, end with a discussion about some of the uh, force projections, nuclear force projections that we're seeing uh, uh, coming out from mainly the U.S. intelligence community. Before I start, just uh, briefly, that um, the, the organization I work for, the Federation of American Scientists, is a private think tank uh, in the United States. We're funded by private uh, foundations. Uh, we don't have sort of direct government affiliation. 
even though we call it the Federation of American Scientists. This was an organization that was started by American nuclear scientists back in 1945 after they developed the nuclear bomb. Um, they wanted to be able to talk to each other about the consequences of what they had invented. And because of secrecy, they were not allowed to talk to other labs. And so they created this federation of American scientists uh, to be able to, to, uh, to discuss this. They produced the membership magazine that was called uh, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. That magazine still exists today. And I'm writing a column in it um, <clears throat> called the Nuclear Notebook that takes sort of snapshots of world nuclear forces. And here you see some slides from our online information that you can all access with the, the link there. So that's a little brief background on it. Now on to China. Um, obviously, phenomenally dramatic developments. I mean, this is uh, unprecedented in terms of the nuclear uh, history of China. Um, we'll see where it goes, but right now it is a, a dramatic departure uh, on many levels from what has been its traditional nuclear policy. Uh, back in, in the old days, so you could say, <laughs> they've had this uh, minimum deterrent uh, with a small arsenal, refusing to participate in an arms race. The modernization has been rather slow and modest, uh, if you will. And it was overwhelmingly focused on land-based missiles. A little uh, sort of um, mission of bombers, but not much. Um, warheads were in storage, not on alert on the, uh, on the missiles. And it was sort of a simple retaliation strategy that if we are attacked, when we see the detonations on our territory, then we have the capability to retaliate. Um, and it was a no first use policy. And again, you know, uh, no threat against non-nuclear weapon states, including uh, non-nuclear weapons free zone, uh, nuclear weapons free zones. So sort of a very uh, con con constrained nuclear posture, if you will. Um, now they're in this dramatic development where they seems to be moving toward what I've called a minimum deterrent. Of course, that is in intended to uh, imply that although they're growing tremendously, they're still not at the level of the United States and Russia, uh, and it's unlikely they're gonna be that at the foreseeable future uh, overall, uh, but it is nonetheless bigger than, significantly bigger than any of the other nuclear armed states in the world um, and smaller than the US and Russia, sort of a minimum, minimum deterrent. Um, and it's characterized by a rapidly growing arsenal. Um, and we we don't know where it's going to go, but you know we are talking about something of a, a probably tripling, even quadrupling of of uh, nuclear weapons in their arsenal. Um, even that will be smaller than what the United States and Russia have in their arsenals, but of course significantly different than what China has now. And also, in they're playing a very active role right now, sort of in increased nuclear competition. Um, they're I wouldn't necessarily call it an arms race in the sense that they're not racing with another country about building the most weapons, but they're in a way racing with themselves <laughs> to uh, significantly increase uh, in a direct competition, primarily with the United States, of course. Um, and it's a very broad modernization. Um, you know, we're talking about, of course, land-based forces, but uh, also this, this, the submarine fleet uh, and now uh, the bombers. Um, and we will see what comes in the future, but that's a sort of a significant broadening to something that I guess it's supposed to look a little more like the triad that, um, that the United States and Russia are uh, operating, uh, but of course still far from the capabilities. Um, and then we see it increasing alert levels. Um, this is a new phenomenon that is a little unclear in the way it's described by intelligence communities in the public, uh, but it appears to mean that a small portion of the force is sort of rotated on alert. Um, still a little unclear whether that means weapons are actually made it to the launchers, but, uh, or whether they're supposed to do it at a very quick uh, rate if necessary. But they're developing what appears to be a launch on warning posture for at least part of their force, uh, possibly the, um, the new silos uh, that they're building. We'll see where that goes, but they, they don't have much space capability so far, but, uh, and so they will have to build up that capacity. Um, and their strategy seems to be evolving more towards a, sort of a, um, a flexible counterattack strategy. The point being <clears throat> the core of it, of course, is still centered around the, 
the need to be able to retaliate with nuclear forces if China is attacked. But there are also apparently sort of escalation steps being uh, explored uh, for more limited use before uh, uh, going to the big uh, scenario. Um, intact seems to be the no first use policy. One can discuss how credible it is, but that has been changed, nor have they changed uh, the threat not to attack non-nuclear countries or uh, nuclear weapons free zones uh, yet. So let me uh, just briefly give some examples of what we've done. Um, We've, for many years, been monitoring what they've been doing, both in central China with their training areas uh, and discovering of their first Jin-class ballistic submarine in 2007, um, using commercial satellite imagery. Um, and then, of course, also most recently that you've heard about um, the large um, uh, missile silos that uh, are now under construction. Um, the, the, the current Chinese arsenal is hard to pin down in details, of course, um, but this is a, an attempt based on publicly available information, how many nuclear warheads we think they are assigned to their forces, to their nuclear capable forces. There's a lot of uncertainty about some of these uh, delivery vehicles. Um, you can see I have the DF-15 and DF-17 in there. The DF-15 is a tactical, so it was rumored to have a nuclear capability. I haven't seen it being deployed with that, so I'm not assigning weapons to it. The DF-17, the U.S. seems to indicate that it might be nuclear capable. Uh, the Chinese are reporting it as a conventional system, so there's a little uncertainty there as well. Some of the bombers, how much of a residual nuclear capability is there in the old bomber force? They're certainly introducing now a new version of it with the air-launched ballistic missile that clearly seems to have a nuclear capability. Um, so sort of a snapshot of, of where they're at. Um, on the land-based missiles, um, here the most dramatic development, of course, is this large uh, buildup of the ICBMs, um, both in mobile, but also uh, increasingly so in silos. Um, we see several examples of it. Here are some pictures from um, uh, the 644th Brigade near Hansong. Um, it's thought to be a DF-41 integration base. Um, and so what you see here is a snapshot from uh, one of the images, this one in 2000, September 2021 last year, where you can see these tents, these uh, large tents outside that we also see used in the training areas for hiding the DF-41s, uh, large, very large uh, launchers. Um, we also see a very significant um, growth of specifically the DF-26, the intermediate range ballistic missile. Uh, several hundreds of these launchers are now deployed. Um, they're, du they're dual capable, so it's probable that only a small portion of them are actually assigned a nuclear role. It's primarily a conventional role, but nonetheless, it's a dramatic uh, development. And of course, overall, what we're seeing here is the phase out of the old liquid fuel uh, ballistic missiles and the replacement uh, with solid fuel missile. That is a development that's been on the way for a long time. It's not a brand new one, but nonetheless. The DF-26, uh, the intermediate range missile I told you about, we can see that popping up in several areas. Um, one is, uh, for example, uh, in the Anhui uh, province, to the left, where you can see DF-26 uh, uh, launchers that are uh, doing an exercise uh, in one of the brigades there, the 611th Brigade. This is interesting because the 611th Brigade traditionally has been thought to be a DF-21 uh, brigade. Um, but uh, we are seeing these uh, 26s either going to those bases to exercise or replacing the DF-21s at those bases. Um, the other example is from Korla uh, in central China. Uh, where the, the DF-26 has been visible for several years now. This is a recent uh, image from last year where you can clearly see the launcher to the left open uh, without a missile uh, in it. And on the right-hand side, it is um, you know, covered with the, uh, the cover that they normally uh, have. Um, most dramatically, of course, is the discovery of the silos uh, that are under construction. We see somewhere around 330 silos that are under construction in three large missile fields. Um, this is a massive uh, construction uh, of a scale we have not seen 
on this planet uh, since the Soviet Union, the United States back in the 1960s and 70s built up their uh, missile silo fields. Um, and it's very dramatic and different to anything that China has done before. Um, to, to the left, you can see uh, one of the silos, a snapshot where the bubble or the, 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 the shelter, uh, inflatable shelter over the silo construction is being uh, taken down. And uh, to the right, you see some examples from one of these uh, sites. This is the Hami site. Uh, where you can see one of the shelters that's still above it and some uh, uh, infrastructure that is under construction. I'll give you some more details about it. These three areas, these three large areas are in areas that are very different from where China has traditionally based its uh, uh, silo missiles. You can see the DF-5 silos, the liquid fuel, they're down in the south uh, and southeast. Whereas these new sites, they're up in the north, tucked up against Mongolia, uh, much deeper inside China, uh, apparently to uh, get away from American conventional capabilities that could hold at risk uh, the silos. Um, and as you can see, as I, you know, these areas, there's also in between a, a, a training area that's called the Jilantai, and I'll tell you a little about why that is important. Um, but, but first, some of the um, facilities... Excuse me? I hear some voices. Oh, sorry. Um, here we see some underground facilities uh, that are under construction. It's still unknown what they are, but they are unique. Never seen anything like it under construction in China. Something obviously associated with these. Uh, there are two of the missile silo fields, underground structures uh, connected by tunnels. Um, potentially something about warhead uh, handling, uh, storage uh, uh, for the site. We don't know, but... Uh, Many many details will have to come up. How did we how did we discover these silos? Well, it all started here in this training area in Jilantai, um, where we discovered a large area with uh, launch pads and training facilities where the uh, uh, the Chinese uh, rocket forces uh, uh, exercise and train operations. Um, this is a new site; it's been only in operation for a few years, and it's expanded dramatically. But it was in this uh, site we could monitor the launchers that are being introduced. Uh, what do they look like on a satellite photo? How do they compare their size? And how do they typically operate? And here you can see a snapshot from a few years back that show both DF-21s, DF-41s, and also the DF-5 in a, in a, in a mobile transport, uh, a transportable function, of course. Um, we also use this site uh, to geolocate when the Chinese military showed videos of uh, missile launchers. Uh, this is an example of how you could do that using the, 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 the terrain, uh, the vegetation, to pinpoint exactly what launch pad was used for a particular, particular site. And this is the DF-26, which has been launched from this area extensively. But it was in this area we first discovered new silos under construction. Um, and these silos, we described in 2019, and they were included in the Pentagon's uh, report from 2020. And this is one of the early uh, examples of that uh, type, uh, type of silo. Um, they, it was this silo type with this bubble of an inflatable, construct, uh, inflatable shelter over the silo construction that enabled us to discover, uh, together with a couple of other NGOs, the large um, missile silo fields, they stand out like a sore thumb. They're so visible from space uh, because of this grid of silos that you can see being constructed. Um, so it was really uh, Jill and Ty that enabled us to see um, what was going on and what to look for. Um, when this bubble or this shelter comes down, um, you can see the outline of a silo hatch um, in an enclosure, um, a, turn, uh, a turn radius vehicle uh, access point, uh, a road that, that leads to the silo where the launcher transporter will come in, uh, and some support uh, infrastructure. There are also cables that connect the, the different um, facilities. Um, the submarines are also in, in, in significant development, of course. Um, as you know, China used to have an experimental submarine, the, 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 the Jin class. Um, 
uh, but it was not successful. It was probably technology development. Um, but now they have a small fleet of so far six gym class uh, submarines. Um, uh, oh, I screwed, there's a mistake here. The experimental was a, a Zia class, I uh, apologize. But the new class is the gym class. So far six in service. They can each carry up to 12 uh, Julang II uh, ballistic missiles. But we're hearing rumors that they might be upgrading to the Julang III. Uh, we don't know how far that program has come so far, but that's some of the rumors. On the, on the picture below, you can see that there is um, you know, full house here. Uh, this is a picture from last year, <clears throat> uh, from before um, the last two uh, submarines were um, became fully operational. So here you're going to see four ballistic missile submarines, uh, as well as two uh, Shan class uh, attack submarines that probably serve as part of the protection of the ballistic submarines when they deploy out into the South China Sea area. Um, on the bombers, we are also seeing a um, uh, the early signs of what is presumably going to be sort of a full-fledged um, nuclear-capable force. Um, right now, it's very limited. Um, there is some residual nuclear capability in the old bomber force, but not fully operational. Um, this part, however, with the new uh, H6N version, it has... Uh, done several flight tests with air an air launch ballistic missile that it thought to be uh, nuclear capable. Um, and it appears that the first base um, is emerging for this operation uh, in the Henan province. Um, here you can see um, satellite imagery uh, of that base uh, with the very, very large um, tunnels into the mountain uh, intended to shelter uh, the bombers when they're not uh, out on the tarmac. And uh, by, by coincidence, at this uh, image, you can see uh, one of the uh, H-6 bombers uh, on the tarmac uh, in the northern part. Uh, there'll be more coming of this, but this, this uh, fleet of uh, a small number of uh, H-6Ns have been uh, operational now for a little over a year. So again, when we... Monitor, when we add all of this stuff up, we're seeing a dramatic um, development, of course, of the Chinese nuclear force posture. Um, and like I said, we have we see something on the order of 330 silos under construction. Um, but we also see significant um, buildup of uh, road mobile ICBMs. Um, the number of bases are increasing um, and older types of launcher are being replaced by newer and more efficient uh, types of launchers. Um, and if the Chinese ICBM silo construction is completed, and once it is completed, if they intend to load all of these silos with, with missiles, then we're approaching a, a, a future situation where China's number of ICBMs could exceed those of Russia um, and certainly approach the US of ICBM force structure size. Um, so this is a totally new situation. Um, it also tells us something about, of course, who this Chinese modernization is primarily directed against. <laughs> uh, it is definitely, uh, it seems, um, a competition with the United States. Um, the U.S. military is projecting uh, upward to around 700 uh, operational or deployable warheads by 2027. And they say that China probably intends to have more than 1,000 by 2030. Now, these projections historically have come with uh, some uncertainty. Uh, in the past, the U.S. intelligence community has also made projection about the Chinese uh, warhead growth. Um, those projections have not uh, panned out. Um, on the contrary, um, it's promised too much too soon. Um, this time is different, it seems to be, uh, not least because everybody can see uh, a lot of what's going on, uh, and that uh, helps substantiate, of course, uh, these estimates. Um, but again, it's unknown how China plans to arm these new silos. Do they indeed plan to fill every single one of them with a missile? Or are they going to do some sort of a shell game where they have only some of them loaded, but an adversary would never know where exactly the, 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 the armed silos are? Um, or do they put everything in there and, and, and basically 
decide to use them as new launchers for their existing DF-31A uh, missiles or the new DF-41. It seems that the U.S. intelligence community, at least initially, is saying that um, they are going to put DF-31 uh, missiles in uh, the silos. Uh, but we're still a long way away from completion of these silos. Uh, it'll take uh, many years for them uh, to be finished. There's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be added. Um, so we're probably looking at sort of the late 20s, uh, somewhere around the 2030s before uh, this force is really operational. Um, and of course, it also hinges on how much plutonium is China going to produce and separate? Uh, and how many warheads are they actually going to produce in their factories? Um, so there's a lot of uncertainties here, but um, some of the broad outlines uh, are available here. And um, I hope this has triggered uh, some questions um, and we can return to sort of the broader, uh, you know, implications of this, uh, including, of course, what it means uh, for India. But with this, um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Doctor. That's been uh, very comprehensive and uh, excellent coverage. Uh, uh, it does raise uh, a fundamental question is uh, what made China change from its, uh, you know, uh, uh, no first use based on, you know, uh, a delayed response to uh, launch on warning strategy one. And second is uh, uh, how much is their focus on the, because unless they perfect the trad, trad and unless they perfect the naval capability, how much will they achieve in, in, in their strategic goals is, is our point as well. Uh, we will come to that and I request the audience to start putting in your questions in the chat box while I invite uh, Ambassador Jair Prasad to look at the implications of Chinese modernization of India-Pakistan uh, scenario as well. It's Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you, Air Marshal Mateshwaran. It's a delight to be here and I'm happy that the Institute for Chinese Studies has got the best person to speak about the Chinese nuclear weapons and missile program as it is today. We have to thank Dr. Hans Christensen and the Federation of American Scientists for their inputs into this because India's open source information about the Chinese progress comes from them. And I remember two years ago when this news that Hans spoke about uh, of the new ICBM silos, 230 of them in two different sites, compared to 20 ICBM silos which China currently has. has. This effectively increases Chinese ICBM capacity if all the silos are filled with ICBMs more than 11 fold. China, of course, dismissed this very casually, uh, I remember. They said that these silo sites were windmill, fa windmill farms. So I have. Uh, four general points and four specific suggestions on where India should go and what it should be doing. The four general points are that India has never been the focal point of Chinese development of nuclear weapons and missiles. Traditionally, China did not consider India a strategic adversary. But this changed in the late 1990s when the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty was being negotiated. China insisted upon entry into force requirements, which made it compulsory to include all countries which might develop nuclear weapons or testing capability, including India. China, if you recall, was also reluctant in the nuclear suppliers group to green light the India-US civil nuclear agreement. And it came around only when all those who were opposed to it came around. China was the last country to come around. The second point is that 
it's been made already by Dr. Christensen that China is increasing or augmenting its nuclear weapons and delivery systems very rapidly. But it's significant that after taking charge, President Xi Jinping established the rocket force, the PLARF, and also the PLA Strategic Support Force, PLAWSF, which is responsible for space, cyber, and electronic warfare. And Xi Jinping called the rocket force a strategic pillar of China's great power status. So it is clear where China is going. China is trying to become a strategic co-equal of the United States and of Russia because its weapons point to United States, Russia, and to India. The separate commands that have been created by Xi Jinping point to a higher salience of nuclear weapons, missiles, space, and cyber weapons in China's armory. They foretell more lethal Chinese weapons of mass destruction, necessitating Indian countermeasures. But these don't necessarily, don't necessarily have to be symmetrical. Nuclear and missile materials and technology to Pakistan pose us special problems because instead of facing a dichotomous dilemma, we face a trichotomous one. So that is a perennial problem which stays with us. <clears throat> the other general point I have is that China cannot freely deploy the third leg of its triad, the SSBNs, the submarine force of the Jin class submarines and the missiles in the Pacific and the Indian Ocean because of their difficult passage from their home ports. Even if deployed, they would be vulnerable to the growing regional anti-submarine warfare assets, including those of India. So they are easily trackable when they come through the South China Sea into the Indian Ocean. The Chinese started sending in their nuclear submarines into the Indian Ocean in 2014, and we have kept track of them. But the facilities that they are building on the Makran coast in Pakistan, including in the Jinnah Air Force Base and the associated Pakistan Naval Facilities, as also their base in Djibouti, at what time these cannot be used because they would be far away from Chinese home bases and very difficult to de defend. Neither can these bases serve to provide China with alternate supply routes for petroleum products and strategic minerals. They have to use the Indian Ocean and they have to use the Malacca Straits. And that brings me to the four specific points that I have, that India must continue to improve its anti-submarine warfare capacity, which is it, it has started. It must improve its NC3, that is the nuclear command control and communications. It must improve also its ISR systems, the early warning intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance capacity. That's number one. Number two is we must augment our interdiction capacity, including by using more effectively the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Then India should continue improving its nuclear weapons and delivery systems, proportionate to the requirements of what we define as 
the minimum nuclear deterrence in causing unacceptable damage to any adversary, including China. And that brings me to the last specific measure, which is more difficult. Given China's increasingly opaque nuclear posture and the growing deployment of dual capable missiles, there is an elevated uncertainty concerning China's nuclear weapons. The rapid expansion of its strategic arsenal <clears throat> are not in accord with the Chinese nuclear doctrine of minimum deterrence. And Dr. Christensen has spoken already about this. But there is an additional point here. China conventionally has mastered the art of preemptive defensive offense in conventional warfare. As during the Korean War between 50 and 53, as during the war with India in October, November, 1962, in wresting control of the Parasol Islands in 1974, the war with Vietnam in 1979, and the military installations constructed on several coral reefs of the Stratley Islands between 2013 and 15. If this were to be applied, to the nuclear domain, then it could transform China's first non-first use and uh, posture, non-use posture against non-nuclear weapons, and be very close to almost a first strike posture. So I think I'll stop here. So I'm not advocating a change of India's nuclear posture. What I'm saying is that we have to watch these developments very closely and wait and watch and see how the Chinese system evolves and accordingly then take a view on it. Thank you, and Marshal Mateshwar. Thank you, Ambassador. That's uh, very well uh, uh, put. The, the importance of uh, India's uh, uh, modernization of its anti-submarine warfare capability, as well as uh, you know, in, uh, accelerating its uh, the sea-based deterrent, which is the submarine-based uh, ballistic missile capability, and and its uh, and the importance of Andaman Ekaba Command comes into focus in the context of what you've covered. Uh, so uh, let me open up uh, to the audience for the uh, questions. And before that, let me invite uh, Dr. Christensen on the first two points that I raised, and we can continue on thereafter. Dr. Hans, any him? Sorry, I didn't hear the, was there a question? Yes, I, I mentioned uh, uh, at the end of your lecture that we would like to now, uh, you know, uh, request a comments or analysis on what made the Chinese change their delayed response strategy with respect to based on the NFU to uh, moving clearly towards a um, uh, launch on warning you know, strategy. What is it that drives them to that process? Is it the rapid developments in technology, the digitization? or ISR <laughs> capabilities, or more importantly, the American push on the ballistic missile defense. Yeah, there, there are a number of potential uh, reasons for this, and I don't think it's solely one of them. Uh, it's most likely a combination, but it's my sense, based on people I've talked to here in the United States, that uh, the clear impression is that the overall driving, primary driving force for this is a deep sense of uh, vulnerability uh, of its uh, small number of silos to a first strike. Um, and, but that's not the only reason. Um, the other reason is cr clearly linked to President Xi's uh, declared ambition to make China uh, a world-class military power. Uh, when you build a world-class military power, you have to uh, have more uh, of what the other world-class military powers have. And 
That is sort of a simplistic way of answering, but I think it's important for the Chinese national prestige that that is uh, what they're working on. Um, but, uh, but there are also dynamic elements that have to do, of course, with um, uh, what kind of uh, adversarial uh, capabilities that China is expecting uh, and is seeing happening around it. Uh, one, of course, is the reach of conventional strike platforms. Um, you will notice, of course, that the US have had for many years the, the Tomahawk cruise missile deployed in the area on, on, on ships and submarines. Recently, we're also seeing the introduction of long-range precision air-launched uh, conventional cruise missiles, uh, known as the JASM, uh, a very efficient and long-range uh, weapons system. Uh, it can hold at risk. Uh, many of the nuclear uh, bases uh, uh, along the, the Chinese uh, eastern area. Um, missile defense, of course, is another element. Not that, I mean, the, the U.S. missile defense system, ironically, even though they say it's, it's, it's sized after North Korea, <laughs> um, would have a, a measurable impact on a launch from Chinese uh, 20 silos. <laughs> um, mm. Not, not all the other systems. Uh, it is easy to overwhelm, it's easy to fool, but from Chinese perspective, uh, it means that there is a potential impact. Um, that system could improve significantly in the future with deployment of uh, the Aegis system uh, in the area as well. Um, so I think there are a lot of factors that contribute to this, but uh, so, so I'm a, I have mentioned here, the other part of your question, was about the ballistic missile submarine, the function Somebody, of the- yes, that's right. Yeah. And, um, uh, and, and here, um, as we heard just before from, from my, my colleague speaker here, was that um, the, 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 the operations of the ballistic missile submarine so far is very constrained, very constrained. The Jin class submarines are relatively noisy, um, on par with what the Russian uh, Delta III ballistic missile submarines were in the 19, uh, early 1980s. Um, uh, they're building a new class. It's a work in progress. Uh, for now, their Julang II uh, missiles cannot reach the continental United States from Chinese waters. Mm -hmm. And these submarines would not survive if they had to sail into the Pacific. Um, and so, uh, so this is a work in progress. Right now, I think they operate in what you can call a bastion uh, in the South China Sea, protected by attack submarines and anti-submarine uh, uh, surface uh, forces. Um, but now we will see deployment of a longer range, Julang 3, um, mm -hmm. that can reach uh, the United States, continental United States from Chinese water. So the, the force will probably continue to operate pretty much where it is, but it'll have longer reach. That's true. But the numbers still seem to be quite uh, uh, less uh, given the context that uh, what you mentioned in, in the context of silos. So the number of silos is huge, like you said, uh, 330 that have been spotted. Yes. Is yes. that a factor of, uh, you know, trying to factor their survivability in a big way in, in case of an incoming attack? Because I yes. believe uh, in today's context, in the context of today's technological capabilities, it is more important to focus on mobile and, uh, you know, unpredictable launch uh, locations, uh, yeah. which can increase their survivability in a bigger way. So uh, how do you look at this in this yeah. context? I totally agree. Uh, the, the Chinese submarine project is somewhat of a mystery. If you, you would look at it, if I were China, I would focus almost entirely on land-based ballistic missile. It has a huge continent. It's easy to hide them, uh, all these things. Um, the submarines are much more vulnerable. So it's not at all supposed to function, I think, as a full uh, balanced triad. Um, this is a work in progress uh, at this stage. Uh, it'll take several more generations of Chinese ballistic missile submarines before they're able to, to operate in a way that we're sort of familiar with the United States and Russia. Um, mm -hmm. So again, a work in progress. Absolutely. Plenty of questions that are lined up. So uh, let me read out. Uh, first is from Umesh Gupta, and uh, he uh, he's, uh, says thanks for the excellent presentation. So he wants to know the sources referred to prepare this report. 
which Chinese language sources are used here uh, is the question from uh, Umesh Kumar, who is an assistant professor of Chinese studies in MIT University. Yes, thank you very much for that question. Um, as you know, the Chinese don't say much about their nuclear forces. Um, they have some very general statements. Um, they have, uh, you know, literature, of course, with discussions about the potential role of their nuclear forces. Uh, but there are very few uh, sort of authoritative documents that are available in China about this. Um, but um, they like to show videos <laughs> of their exercises. And so what has been a, an interesting source from China has been the Chinese military's own videos when they do exercises. And from those videos over the last 10 years, it's been possible to uh, identify many of the bases, uh, what particular launchers are at the particular bases, because we can compare what we see on the videos and what we can see on an, a satellite photo. Um, and so it, it's a surprising, I, can, I guess, glitch perhaps uh, uh, in their secrecy. But but by and large, uh, the sources for the factual information here are overwhelmingly from uh, uh, Western, US primarily intelligence, um, they report vividly on this and have done so for many, many years. Um, and then, of course, it's also using our own work with analyzing the, the, the Chinese base uh, infrastructure and the developments of new launchers that are coming to those bases. So it's a, it's a broad spectrum of sources. Next one is from Kanishk Veg. Uh, uh, as the ambassador has highlighted, India must develop the Andaman Nicoba Islands and anti submarine warfare to thwart the threat of Chinese SSBNs. But as China builds airstrips and airfields on Myanmar, can this further cause problems? If so, what should be done? So, uh, either uh, uh, both can respond to it. Ambassador, you want to start first? You want to unmute yourself, Ambassador. I'm sorry. Yeah. The Chinese don't have the latitude to deploy weapons of their choice on facilities that are granted to them, either in Myanmar or in Sri Lanka. So the question of that happening seems to be a bit remote right now. And we are keeping an eye on that, of course the people responsible would be keeping an eye on it. And if that were to happen, it will become a serious matter to us because we just learned that the Chinese are developing air-launched nuclear-capable missiles loaded on stealth bombers. So that will be a problem for us if it were to happen. Yes, the H-20 is expected to be operational by 2025. So, Dr. Christensen, would you want to comment on this point as well? Well, I don't have any specific information about the airfields there, and certainly, but I doubt, I doubt it has any direct implication for China's nuclear posture. Um, they will primarily use these uh, forward bases for surveillance, uh, for logistical support, um, but I think the nuclear posture uh, for China's uh, for China's perspective is likely to remain very uh, home based, very domestic, not forward based. That's right. Admiral Sina has raised his hand. Uh, Shekhar, sir, go ahead with your question. Uh, well, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Dr. Hans and Ambassador uh, Jen, for a really very, shall I say, an educative and. Uh, uh, you know, a learned sort of discourse. Uh, I just want to make two points, the general two points, really. Uh, and uh, Ambassador was absolutely right in saying that, uh, you know, our capabilities should be developed with respect to what China does, but let's watch them first. I would suggest, I would go to the extent of suggesting that in addition to what is happening to anti-submarine warfare capability, there are two capabilities which... Uh, India must uh, look at it very seriously because there is a very long gestation period. The first one is a theater missile defense program. Uh, because if we are not going to be very offensive, then sh we should have the ability to defend our bigger cities, our capital cities, uh, which is within reach of the 
uh, long range missiles uh, from china which can be fired from the uh, silos the second one is to speed up the icbm uh, submarine uh, building program the ssbn uh, and its integration with the agni 5 uh, type of missile um, and i i would very seriously think that in the times of uh, uh, you know friction and likely to uh, some intelligence report we should be able to deploy uh, two of them Uh, at least one on the eastern seaboard and one western seaboard we should take care of both uh, in case pakistan is being used as a proxy my personal opinion is it's only matter of time that when china's uh, indian ocean fleet will start operating from quader uh, and second one from the uh, you know from bay of bengal we should cover by and large uh, right up to beijing and beyond so i think that these two projects because they have gestation period slow build up should while we are watching because once we are watching and we say that oh he's made it uh, then it's going to be very difficult for uh, uh, us to do the catch up then we'll only be defending so i think these two theater uh, you know de- defense uh, missile defense which i think air force has done a lot of study so has the uh, you know the strategic force command and i think that should be given some priority thank you thank you chair thank you uh, uh, admiral sena uh, admiral murli would you want to say anything we have questions Yeah, uh, thank you, Amash Mateshan. I agree with them and uh, with uh, Dr. Hans as well as Ambassador Jain Prasad. I think he made a very relevant point. One thing that we need to look at was these missile or silos or missiles which can, you know, be interchangeable. I mean, right now it may look like a normal, just tactical or uh, surface-to-surface missile, but in the same silo you can launch nuclear missiles. That's the most dangerous thing. especially if they can be embarked on ships or submarines they could be based anywhere in the indian ocean and pass or the or the indo pacific in general which could be launched so that is where uh, i think i agree with that was in the theater defense which he talked of which we should look at our major centers uh, the other is again we have no option but to develop our uh, you know long range uh, nuclear weapons and submarines capability it that would provide the right kind of difference and these all take time and money i mean i that see i mean that's the thing but i think what we need to watch for this point made by ambassador prasad this dual change is something that we need to really look at worry about thank you thank you admiral here's a question from uh, dr ramesh uh, abhilash ramesh in the event of a security crisis elevated to nuclear confrontation would mutually assured destruction doctrine be implemented especially factories factoring population risk would the panelist look at uh, this question dr questions yeah i'm trying to f- find the the Take question um uh, yeah i don't see the question here uh, could you repeat the question i did, i can't see it on the, the okay uh, in the event of a security crisis elevated to a nuclear confrontation one mutually assured destruction doctrine be implemented especially factoring population risk uh, yeah i i you know one of this is one of the big unknowns of course um how how far is it going to go but at the ultimate level of course uh, cities are primary targets um and you can certainly not assume that they will not be hit um so i mean so the 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 devastation uh, uh, at at the full scale con- uh, nuclear conflict of course is overwhelming um what what you could hope uh so to speak uh or what you could wonder about is are there signs in the chinese nuclear posture that indicate that they're putting more emphasis on limited use and i'm saying this because there is a question uh, among them here about a uh, possible chinese tactical <laughs> nuclear weapons it happens mm-hmm. and and so far we have not seen sort of what you in us and russian context would call tactical you know short range theater weapons having said that however uh, india of course has medium and intermediate range weapons and if you read the us military's description of Chinese nuclear forces the US military calls those forces tactical because they're regional um but 
it's not clear that the Chinese have a uh, sort of a public. If I identity. if I rephrase that, the tactical in the, in the correct context, let's call it as low yield weapons in the battlefield. Will they be deployed? Low will yield. They be used? Well, yeah. Well, um, low yield is an interesting characterization because in the U.S. and Russian arsenals, tactical nuclear weapons don't necessarily have low yield. They can, but there are also some strategic weapons that have low, lower yield options. So it's, it's a little more blurred than that. I think the, the description of tactical or regional is more about the, the range of the system and what scenario could be, they be used in. And so here I think the, the, the interest is, uh, are the Chinese developing strategies in which they would begin a nuclear response with a regional attack and then build up from there if uh, de-escalation is not successful. Ambassador, uh, don't you think the tactical nuclear weapon discussion or debate in India has been uh, somewhat a little different, particularly with the context of Pakistan having developed uh, PNWs and, you know, often hinted at, you know, possible use of it. And therefore, uh, one generally presumed or one generally understood this as low yield weapons which could be, uh, you know, used to blunt an armor offensive from Indian side. And the Chinese have never spoken about, you know, usage of low-yield weapons in any context so far in, the, in their official com communications. But uh, India's position has generally been that any nuclear weapon is a nuclear weapon, and therefore the escalation, you know, limit will be breached if any, any kind of a nuclear weapon is used at any stage. How do you look at that? It's a debate that has gone on for a long time, and a lot of commentators want India to redefine its nuclear posture. Confronted by the problem that Pakistan has low yield tactical battlefield nuclear weapons. But, you know, our nuclear doctrine is such that gives India already the latitude. Yes. that in response to a nuclear attack, we can decide what to do, whether to retaliate with all that we have or retaliate also in a similar way as before. Sorry, just excuse me a second. Sorry, there was somebody at the door. Uh, so the problem uh, for India is simply non-existent as I see it, because we are developing better missiles, better delivery systems, which are short and medium range. And slowly our force also is changing from liquid fueled to solid fueled. And there it is also becoming more precise. So I go back to the first question, which was about mutually assured destruction and population centers. And here, the, there is a basic dilemma of the use of nuclear weapons, because nuclear weapons are a very special type of weapon. It is an ultimate force of dissuasion. And the moment you use nuclear weapons, against a nuclear adversary, you are writing your own death sentence and the adversary's death sentence, of course. So the whole purpose of nuclear weapons is not to use them paradoxically, which is very difficult. And that is why you have the bulletin of atomic scientists that have that doomsday clock. So, it's a kind of philosophical question, really. That's true. Absolutely. Here's an interesting one, uh, and uh, for uh, both of you, are the military restrictions with economically well-off nations like Japan an additional motivation to Chinese uh, nuclear modernization? I presume he says militarization, but I take it as nuclear modernization. It's an interesting question because I feel that you know, you asked in the beginning, what is the impact going to be of Russia's nuclear alert or placing its weapons on 
a higher status. I have a feeling that it would impel countries which have the wherewithal and the capacity to develop nuclear weapons to go in that direction. You know, Japan has been successful in resisting American pressure in keeping its separated plutonium in stockpile. And if it were to decide to go nuclear, it can do so in a very short period of time. With South Korea, the problem is going to be a bit longer because they don't have the latitude that the Japanese were able to extract. So Ukraine itself is a good example because at one level, President Putin's alert was a warning sign to NATO and the United States not to directly confront the Soviet, the Russians in Ukraine. But it was also a signal to the Ukrainians. So the message is very clear. Look, I am going a bit out here by suggesting that United States did not want India to have nuclear weapons and tried very hard. And we had rather difficult conversations also with the former Soviet Union at the behest of the United States. Mm -hmm. And with the United States, we didn't have what we could say excellent or good relations. We had normal state-to-state -state relations. But once we had nuclear weapons, our relationship with the United States dramatically changed for the better. So similarly, the Ukraine-Russia example is also not going to augur well for proliferation or non-proliferation. Dr. Hans, how do you look at that? Another the ambassador has opened up that topic. Yeah, it's one of these big issues that, that is being discussed here in Washington, of course, also. Um, how is it going to influence non-proliferation? Because non-proliferation has been such a pillar uh, of international security policy all these years and, and a, a central element of, of U.S. Uh, policy, of course. Um, and that's also, of course, where the reaction to India when it developed its nuclear uh, weapons uh, originated. Uh, it was uh, clearly an American attempt to, 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 to stop proliferation and, and somehow con come down hard on those that did proliferate. Um, still trying to do that, um, but it, it looks different now. The good news, if you could say that, is that there are relatively few countries today that are sort of thought to be seriously considering nuclear weapons, uh, in, in proliferating nuclear weapons. Of course, Iran is an important element. It could have implications for other countries such as Saudi Arabia, what have you. Uh, and in South Korea, they are also, uh, there's a strong public support for developing nuclear weapons. But in Japan, there's a, an enormous opposition to developing nuclear weapons capability because of its history. Um, so it's, it's very different from country to country where you go. Um, one other thing I just want to remind, in terms of Chinese military capability, I just look, look at what's happening with Russia in Ukraine. It is a big surprise how much trouble the large Russian military forces have in Ukraine. And one of the reasons I hear from U.S. military analysts is that, as it turns out, the Russian military is not very good at conducting joint operations. Uh, it's, it's losing out in, in many scenarios where it shouldn't. Um, that's a large military force. China has zero military fighting cap uh, experience, none. And so all of its, it can train all it wants, but it has no real combat experience. And so that's important to keep in mind when making assessments about how significant the Chinese military capability is. It's, a, it's one thing to build a lot of planes and a lot of missiles, but how are you going to use them in, in a real war? That's important as well. Well, certainly. I mean, that famous saying is that every best of your plans will work only till the first shot is fired, right? So the leadership and strategic, uh, you know, experience, and uh, they do, uh, you know, make a lot of difference. But notwithstanding that, I mean, the 
I look at the Russian experience. Uh, I think we need to look more deeper into it as a very calibrated strategy in employing their force. Certainly, they've also been surprised with the fierce resistance from the Ukrainians. But I think the larger objective needs to be, you know, looked at carefully because I don't think Putin wants uh, to demolish Ukraine to make his point. I think his the entire objective is to wean Ukraine away from, you know, moving closer to EU and NATO and get it back into the Russian orbit. Uh, and if that needs to be done, he also needs to keep his, you know, ability to create damages to a, as minimum as possible. That's one point. But coming to the uh, next point in, in terms of nuclear strategy and, and use of nuclear strategy, hasn't Putin exhibited uh, the real ability to use uh, or uh, leverage his nuclear capability in preventing the West from actively engaging in the conflict? And does that portend for a change in the future? And does that give lessons to, you know, China and India as well? Yeah. Um, he has rattled the nuclear sword, of course. He's raised his uh, alarms. Uh, he has officially said he has increased the alert level. He has warned NATO. Um, but that is Putin's style. That He's done that many times in the past also. Uh, and we have seen Russian generals and ambassadors make very explicit nuclear threats to NATO countries. Um, some of them over ballistic missile defense, by the way. Um, so it is, yes, he's using the nuclear sword, but it's an, an explicit nuclear signal to the United States not to get involved. Um, it's not so much about using nuclear weapons in Ukrainian conflict. Uh, uh, it's more this strategic talk. Um, but if we look at what's happening on the ground, we can, there's, there's no change in the Russian nuclear uh, force structure or operations. Uh, so for now, it seems to be almost entirely just rhetoric. Uh, so yeah, you can say that he's trying to use this to prevent NATO from, or the United States from going in and helping Ukraine. But that was expected, uh, and they would probably have done that in many other situations. He hinted that when he invaded uh, Crimea also. That was also his message at that time. Uh, so it's not entirely new what's happening here, but of course it's worthwhile keeping an eye on. Uh, there's a question from uh, Ambassador Ashok Kanta. So it's firstly, excellent presentations. Three questions to Dr. Hans uh, Christensen. What are the implications of China's changing nuclear doctrine, including shift towards launch on warning? I think we discussed that earlier. What, what's Chinese thinking on tactical nuclear weapons in its arsenal? Please share your thoughts on the implications of China's nuclear modernization for India. Yes, thank you for those questions. For the doctrine, um, we have seen a number of exercises going back to 2017, where the Chinese uh, military has trained uh, launch scenarios with ICBMs that involved uh, one satellite um, providing launch on warning uh, mm -hmm. capability. Um, they're quite clearly developing that technology or developing the technology to move towards such a capability. Uh, but I want to remind people that in a way, the Chinese have always had a launch on warning. It just didn't involve uh, space-based sensors. sensors. The, the warning was nuclear explosions on the ground. And the idea was uh, to get be able to respond despite those uh, uh, explosions on the ground. Now they're trying to extend that warning out further so they have more time to react. Um, so that's their effort to protect their uh, strategic retaliatory capability. Um, the United States and Russia have had such a posture for many, many decades. Um, so we'll see where they go with it and what it means. I will warn a little against making the assumption that that posture necessarily means an end to no first use. I've heard some people say that. I don't agree with it. It could easily have a launch on a uh, warning posture and no first use policy could still exist, whether you believe it would actually um, hold up in a war or not. But that's that's another one. Chinese thinking on tactical nuclear weapons. 
Not so much. Um, they normally think of nuclear weapons as just nuclear weapons, but, and the, but it's about where the counterattack is going to happen. Some you need long range to hit the United States. Some you need medium, intermediate range to hit Guam, to hit uh, forces in, in the near region. It's not necessarily a tactical nuclear weapons thinking like we think about it in, in Russia and China, uh, and in Russia and uh, the United States. Um, implications uh, for India, well, obviously, um, it is something India needs to keep a close eye on, but the biggest challenge will be to figure out what part of the Chinese modernization is directly motivated with the relationship with India mm. versus the relationship with the United States. And overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, as far as I can see, the, the modernization that's happening right now is, is predominantly about uh, the United States. Well, centric, yes. And there are three uh, questions from Venkat. What are the Chinese views on strategic arms reduction treaty? And are there any inputs to use artificial intelligence in Chinese nuclear systems? Yes, that's an interesting question. I mean, on, on the arms control side, uh, the Chinese are not interested. Um, they have for many, many years said, um, you know, Russia, the United States, when you come down to our level, then we'll talk. <laughs> But right now, they're not interested in pursuing this. Uh, the Trump administration tried very hard, of course, in its own very uh, primitive way uh, to sort of coerce China to join arms control talks. But of course, that didn't work. Um, but even though China may not be interested in traditional nuclear arms control, like we know it in the sense of the New START treaty and things like that, they may be interested in pursuing other elements of strategic relations that have to do with capabilities of offensive forces in their areas. Um, what kind of operations are military forces doing? Sort of um, uh, agreements about avoiding uh, crises and incidents, things like that. There may be other elements of arms control uh, or confidence building measures where it will be possible to have get a conversation going with the Chinese. Ambassador, any points on that? Yes, sir. You're muted. You'll have to unmute yourself. I don't think the Chinese are in particular looking for trouble. Mm. They probably in the strategic domain, they, till they pull up on par, which will take them another 10, 15 years. Mm. They don't want to confront anybody and they certainly will be reticent about saber rattling on the nuclear front. That's my feeling. But they are quietly building their capacities. And so somebody made the point that the time, uh, Admiral Sinha said that it takes a lot of time to build capacity. Yes. Like the SSPN capacity or the SLCM capacity. The problem here is that the time lag between India and China. China tested its nuclear weapon in 64. We tested a device in 74, but weapons in 98. So the lag that we have in developing better capacities and capabilities has become actually shorter. Mm. And the question is one of putting the right resources into this effort. So I don't see that China is going to pose a particular threat in that sense. But to Dr. Christensen, I have this to say that if China improves itself vis-a-vis -vis the United States or Russia. Obviously, part of its arsenal, because it is directed against us or aimed at us or devoted to us, will be affected willy-nilly. And the other element is that as China modernizes, it continues to pass on whatever it learns or whatever it develops to Pakistan, that poses a problem to India. 
So I don't think we can have a completely benign attitude to what China is doing. Absolutely. That's a very important observation. Uh, There's an interesting question from uh, Surbhi uh, Muggal to Dr. Hans. Uh, citing fractional orbital bombardment system as an example of test, example tested by China and Russia last year. Do you think the Chinese nuclear strategy is more focused on technological innovation to counter the US instead of increasing the number of warheads? Uh, yes, I think that's probably the case. Uh, uh, it's not a black and white, but it's a it's a strong factor in the Chinese um, way of doing things militarily. Um, it is almost as if anything they can get their hands on, they will try to uh, copy and uh, further develop. Um, not all of it necessarily ends up being deployed. Some is put on the shelf, so to speak, as a technology, or part of it will emerge later on as part of some other technology. So. This is a very important driver in the Chinese in the Chinese approach to modernization. Um, that said, it's a little hard to figure out what they want to do with that um, fractional orbit uh, orbital uh, bombardment system because, you know, compared to everything else they have, um, it sort of seems to me to be a niche technology experiment, um, not something that matters strategically. Uh, but we'll see where they go with it. It's definitely an interesting development. Uh, let me raise one uh, important uh, you know, question from my side, is that the rocket forces, the Chinese uh, articulation of their uh, doctrine clearly uh, says that the rocket forces are both conventional as well as nuclear missiles and weapons. So. Uh, how does that play out? Because uh, in the context, yes, can we just depend and rely that because they have an NFU that they will never launch first uh, nuclear weapons, given the animosity and the environment that exists in the subcontinent, in the three nuclear weapon states at each other's throat. And uh, the second part is, uh, uh, how much are they, uh, have they kept the ambiguity of nuclear uh, uh, warheads on their cruise missiles? in terms of what your institution has you know, learned and analyzed their capabilities? Yeah, good questions. Um, <clears throat> there's been a lot of uh, rumors about cruise missiles with nuclear capability over the last 10 years, um, but we haven't seen anything substantial and the US intelligence community is, is not saying it. And even when there were a couple of documents that had some hints about it, uh, they were cleaned up uh, later on. Um, so it's not something that we see prominently. The air launch ballistic missile, of course, is sort of a half step to that capability. Um, but it becomes really interesting once they develop their new strategic bomber. Um, depending on what that's going to be, how long is its range going to be, you know, how are they going to operate it, these types of things. Because, of course, it could be that that is just intended to carry a ballistic missile as well. Um, uh, but it could also be that there are some other technologies they want to uh, merge with that new platform. But we haven't seen them yet. Uh, on this issue of the conventional mix, that is a really, really uh, important issue, of course, because, and I know it's one that's causing a lot of concern in the United States military because of the risk that you can misread a, a, a buildup, you can misread a, a military signal, and you can even misread preparation to launch. Um, so this is a really serious issue for crisis stability. Um, I think we see it primarily being a problem for, of course, right now with the DF-26, the intermediate range, because apparently you can swap the warhead in the field uh, from nuclear to conventional and the other way around. Uh, yeah, so this is a, a really uh, potential for, for crisis uh, problems, um, but that seems to be where the Chinese are going uh, very strongly. They, they firmly believe in that mix. Um, I just wanna remind that the Chinese are not the only ones doing this. I mean, the Russians of course also have dual capable short range ballistic missile systems. And both the United States and Russia have dual capable strategic bombers. They fly both with conventional and nuclear 
cruise missile capabilities. Uh, some of the bomb, US B-52 bombers that are right now operating in, in Europe, and mm. I see two of them are up in the air right now, uh, they have both uh, conventional and nuclear capabilities. So, so this dual use problem is not entirely new, but it's very uh, in your face, I would say, in terms of the Chinese missile force. So, Ambassador, how do we deal with it? Because uh, the Chinese articulation with respect to their uh, uh, military strategy in their white paper clearly says their first line of attack in the event of a war will be using the rocket forces. And uh, particularly with respect to our air defenses and uh, our uh, airfields and military installations in the Northeast, how does this play out? How do we factor in terms of our strategy and response to it? There is absolutely no question that we have to respond in kind and develop the same capacity as rapidly as we can. So we have a cruise missile, which is pretty good standard right now. And we have to develop also other missiles. No, my question is uh, in the context of the nuclear issue. So we do we believe and rely that the Chinese will adhere to the NFU and therefore a rocket attack, rocket force attack will be conventional and we are prepared to respond conventionally or do we, uh, you know, respond and launch on warning assuming it could be a nuclear attack? No, no, we don't have to go in that direction at all because it's, it should never be that we assume the worst worst because the Chinese are not going to escalate so quickly unless they lose heavily in the battlefield, unless India makes a very big ingress into China. Because out of the blue for the Chinese to attack India with nuclear weapons, I don't think it is a realistic possibility. But it doesn't mean that we should not prepare for that eventuality. As Admiral Sinha said, we must develop, because if we have the capacity technologically, we must develop a regional and theater missile defenses, because it's our duty to do that. Yeah. And we must be prepared, but we must not assume that the Chinese are just because they have improved launch on warning capacity, they are going to attack us with nuclear weapons. I don't think that's on the cards right now. And even if we have a conventional conflict with China, which is not unthinkable because of the problems that we have on our borders, I think if we have adequate conventional capacity to deal with the Chinese, we have, of course, the ultimate nuclear deterrence capacity, which we are confident about, and that should be enough. Thank you, Ambassador. And uh, uh, hence, the last question is uh, with respect to uh, you know the Chinese uh, modernization, nuclear modernization, and nuclear modernization has to be supported by. Uh, developments in multiple areas in terms of space, in terms of uh, technology innovations. The Chinese are going great guns in the space domain particularly. So how do you actually look at this modernization with respect to their quite significant ISR capability and, uh, and uh, their uh, cyber and intelligence capabilities in other domains? Yeah, there's a uh, big development from, from uh, by, by Chinese standards. There's some big developments on the way, of course. Uh, their primary right now, their primary, there are several several things going on in parallel. One, one has to do with provide the adequate, uh, secure uh, nuclear command and control system, so that the Chinese forces in the structure we're now seeing starting to uh, take shape um, will be able to respond in the right way and in a controlled way, so to speak. Um, because it's not enough just to have a sort of a telephone line where you call the brigades and say, now launch. 
I mean, you can imagine a much more dynamic uh, environment in which you have to, um, you know, communicate uh, more specifically back and forth between the National Command Authority and, and the brigades. Um, but to do that effectively and interact, they have to have early warning in space uh, so they can detect what is coming. They have to have uh, uh, intelligence uh, so they can see what has happened <laughs> uh, and, and respond to it uh, in the second phase, so to speak. So there, there are all these layers that are, that are being uh, refined in order to come together as a whole, if you will, to be more effective in operating a force. Um, but they still have a long way to go. And there are certain elements of the nuclear posture that is more developed than others. And one of the biggest challenges right now, of course, is on the ballistic missile submarines. How do you ensure uh, communication with ballistic submarines deployed uh, in a nuclear environment. Um, that is a huge challenge that the United States and the Soviet Union used decades and decades to refine. Um, and the Chinese have a long way to go. Um, you know that traditionally they have not been interested in deploying nuclear weapons on their submarines um, because of central military control uh, from the leadership. Um, and it's not clear to me that they have started doing that yet. At least I have not heard American intelligence say that explicitly. Um, although they do exercise the submarines, of course. Uh, but that would be an interesting new development that would require them to have developed some uh, pretty significant nuclear command and control for the ballistic missile submarines. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Dr. Hans. Here's the final question with respect to India's NFU policy, given the environment in which uh, you know, rapidly evolving environment with uh, China's nuclear modernization and, and conventional force modernization as well. Uh, should India continue with its NFU policy or should we take a relook at it? And with that, I think I invite your concluding remarks for the today. It's been a great pleasure uh, having this discussion with you both. Yeah. Ambassador, uh, yes. start, Dr. Hans can start. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, I don't think the China's modernization um, affects the no first use policy explicitly or necessarily. Um, it depends. Um, I mean, all countries that have nuclear weapons have the capability to use nuclear weapons first if they decide to do so, whether they have a first use policy or no first use policy. Mm. So in a wartime situation, you cannot count on a country not using nuclear weapons. In fact, I would find surprising if any nuclear weapon state would not use nuclear weapons first if it thought it was necessary to for the survival of, of the country. Um, the, the importance of no first use, I think, is more about what it can do in peacetime, that it can perhaps calm down some of the nervousness that otherwise exists. And frankly, if a country has a no first use policy, it can also help dampen the ambitions in the military ranks to want to develop a more aggressive nuclear posture. So that it can serve a very important function in peacetime. Um, so that's sort of how I would say the no first use policy. I still don't see the Chinese clearly moving away from no first use policy. Absolutely. I think, uh, Ambassador, your points? I agree with the, this proposition that the Chinese are not going to give up on the non-use policy against non-nuclear weapon states and the non-first use policy. But, you know, the earlier discussion raised an important issue. What happens if you have the SSPNs carry nuclear tip missiles? The Chinese will have to necessarily alter their nuclear posture because by definition, the missiles on a submarine which is operating away from the home base, will have to have the nuclear weapon mated with the missile. And right now, the whole idea of a controlled response or a measured response is based on the fact that countries are not in that kind of readiness to launch on warning straight away. And especially, if the Chinese are getting the satellite capacity for ISR and they launch on warning, it creates a very troubling situation. So 
I agree that if a country has nuclear weapons, it might be tempted to attempt a kind of counterforce strategy against a nuclear adversary if it feels confident that it can get away with it. So the whole point of the Indian nuclear deterrent is that we have to ensure that we have a survivable second strike capacity. And that is the most important. Not only should we have that capacity, but we have to let our adversaries know and see that we have that capacity. Thank you, Ambassador. The uh, bottom line is, of course, uh, both India and China, I consider them as mature nuclear weapon states, and therefore the NFE policy is extremely vital. And, and the focus should be on creating a second strike capability. It's been a great pleasure, Dr. Hans Christensen and uh, Ambassador Jain Prasad. It's a great pleasure to have moderated the discussion with you. And I'm sure the audience would have enjoyed. 